Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Getting Ready for Report Cards, Understanding Ontario's Single Language Mark. We're happy that you are all able to join us this evening. And before we get going, I want to start our time together by acknowledging that Dyslexia Canada and IDA Ontario serve individuals on the traditional territories of all the First Nations, Inuit, and Métis across Canada. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to our country. This acknowledgement reminds us of our responsibilities to our responsibilities to our relationships and the ancestral lands on which we learn, share, and live. So we are so happy that you are able to join us this evening. And here is a quick overview of how we're going to structure our time together this evening, beginning with an overview of some of the basics of evaluation, what has and has not changed with the new language curriculum, and some considerations as we determine one mark and the comments to support that on the report card. We're then going to hear from our wonderful onlet panelists as they share updates on their case studies in primary, junior, and intermediate, their observations, conversations, and products, their use of the achievement chart, and how they determined one mark based on evidence of learning. We're going to wrap up our time together this evening with questions, and thank you to those of you that submitted questions in advance. We've sprinkled those all throughout the webinar. Uh, if any questions pop up that you'd like to share with the presenters, please put them in the Q&A box and not in the chat, and we will address them at the end. As we wrap up, we will find out who has won our prize. And tonight's prize is Next Steps in Literacy Instruction, the second edition. And this book really provides clear and practical answers to how educators can translate the results of universal screening into evidence-based instruction, targeted interventions, and improved reading outcomes. It's a fantastic read. Uh, Onlet has done some book clubs with this book, both in English and in French this winter. You can check out those slides from both the English and the French on onlet.org. And there are recordings of the French session that you can check out while you're there. And to note, this book is also available for free through the OCT library. So stick around until the end of the session tonight to see if you are the winner. Before we dig in, I wanted to take a moment to introduce the team that's joining me tonight and thank them for helping to gather all of the great information that we're going to be sharing. Laura, Siobhan, and Melissa are members of our curriculum assistance team and have shared some case studies that we're going to take a look at a little bit later. We also have our onlet team answering questions in the Q&A, so if questions come up as we chat tonight, place them in the Q&A and we will do our best to get you an answer or let you know that an answer is coming. And I am going to start us off. I am Jordan Sloan, a bilingual literacy coach with the Renfrew County District School Board, and I've had the pleasure of working with Onlet since its launch. I was the co-host of the Coaching Network and the host of the French Next Steps Book Club, and love sharing the work that we do through Onlet. So as we get into this material, I want to emphasize that we are presenting general suggestions. Your board may have specific policies and requirements, and without a doubt, these take precedence over anything that we are going to suggest tonight. Listen to your board before you listen to us. You will also want to seek guidance from your board with regards to reporting policies for multilingual learners and special education, as well as for their policy around the use of the NA for the early reading screening section of the new report card. And we are all coming to this journey from our own starting places and have experienced learning at our own pace and in our own way. So as we move through tonight's material, please be mindful that everyone is coming to this from their own understanding and from a place of trying to improve their practice. Consider what you can learn from engaging with viewpoints that do not mirror your own. Engage critically with the content. Do not allow your first thought to be your only thought. Know that growing and learning means that you may shift your positions, revisit your assumptions, and advance your thinking, and ensure that conversations are supportive, fostering an environment for growth and learning. So let's get started with some evaluation basics. We will start with what has not changed before digging into what has evolved. We are going to look into comments, evaluation versus assessment, and sources of assessment data. So what has not changed? Point one on this slide is a reminder that we teach and assess the specific expectations of the curriculum, but that we evaluate a student's achievement of the overall expectations for that grade. This has not changed from the previous language curriculum, and it's applicable to all subject areas of our Ontario curriculums. We certainly continue to differentiate for our students, to meet them where they're at, and to work with them to fill gaps and continue forward momentum. And in some cases, we may be addressing things that are not part of our grade level curriculum with our whole class. When it comes to evaluation and reporting, 
Growing success reminds us that evaluation accurately summarizes and communicates what students know and can do with respect to the overall curriculum expectations. Remember that these are grade level expectations for the end of the school year and that your professional judgment plays a part in determining how a student is evaluated. The second point reminds us of just that, the value of our professional judgment as we determine which specific expectations to use when we evaluate the achievement of the overall expectations. We use that judgment to determine which expectations we will instruct and assess, but not necessarily evaluate. Remember that Growing Success states that determining a report card grade involves the interpretation of evidence collected through observations, conversations, and student products combined with the teacher's professional judgment. Another thing that has not changed is the use of the achievement chart as a framework for assessing and evaluating student achievement of the expectations of a particular subject or discipline. It enables teachers to make consistent judgments about the quality of student learning based on clear performance standards and on a body of evidence collected over time. It also provides teachers with a foundation for developing clear and specific feedback for students and parents. The achievement chart provides a way to organize the knowledge and skills students need to demonstrate into four broad categories of knowledge and skills. And it also describes a range of four levels, performance standards that are used to measure or define the quality of a student's achievement of the expectations in a particular subject. Teachers assess and evaluate student work with reference to the achievement chart that is standard across the province. The achievement chart for language has been updated to provide examples that align with the new curriculum and to include nonverbal communication, stating expression and organization of ideas and information in oral, nonverbal, visual, and or written forms, including digital and media forms. A set criteria is identified for each category in the achievement chart. So this is a quote, the criteria are subsets of the knowledge and skills that define the category. The criteria identify the aspects of student performance that are assessed and or evaluated, and they serve as a guide for, uh, to what teachers look for. Descriptors indicate the characteristics of the student's performance with respect to particular criterion on which assessment or evaluation is focused. Effectiveness is the descriptor used for each of the criteria in the thinking, communication, and application categories. What constitute effectiveness in any given performance task will vary with the particular criterion being considered. Assessment of effectiveness may therefore focus on a quality such as appropriateness, clarity, accuracy, precision, logic, relevance, significance, fluency, flexibility, depth, or breadth as appropriate for the particular criterion. And that comes from our language curriculum. Using those four categories of the achievement chart and the overall and specific expectations of the curriculum that relate to those categories, teachers can then select appropriate assessment methods and strategies that allow them to directly assess evaluate and track student achievement. So all four categories must be reflected in the report card grade and each category must be a significant factor in evaluating student achievement. When assigning a grade or a mark, we need to consider the students integrated learning across the strands in each reporting period collected over time and using multiple sources of evidence increases the reliability and validity of the evaluation of student learning. So here we're looking at conversations and those can be student teacher conversations. They can be what students are saying about the learning, for example, through questions, connections, extensions, oral written reflections, uh, through student teacher conferences. We might note the use of new words, explanations for self-correction, formulation of questions, contributions to whole group and small group discussions. We're looking at observations, how students are interacting with the learning in small groups, partner work, skills, discussion. We might hear students trying to decode words accurately. We might notice them making um, corrections in their own reading and spelling, looking for books with more challenging words, contributing to vocabulary lists, or even transferring knowledge to new concepts. And we're looking at products. And products are activity or task that is a response to the learning, such as written work, could be models, graphic organizers, videos, songs, dramatizations, posters, quizzes. We might see our students creating word webs or decoding new words in various content areas, um, reading a decodable text fluently and accurately, retelling a story or writing sentences or simple stories. Our students might write letters to friends or to relatives. They might label diagrams, maybe create comic strips or maybe even story maps. 
So moving on to what has changed, the 2023 addendum to growing success has shifted to reporting student achievement as one overall grade or mark with supporting comments, with the idea that all of the strands are connected and it's gonna foster a cohesive appro approach to both the instruction and the assessment across the curriculum. The ministry emphasizes that we should consider the students integrated learning across the strands in each reporting period when determining a single mark. We as teachers are accustomed to seeing the strands, so literacy connections and application, foundations of language, comprehension and writing in silos, and providing instruction and assessing and learning in those areas without necessarily considering them as a whole. We see the impact that the strands have upon one another, but we also see our students struggle in some areas more than others. And we really do, we, we wanna see growth and we wanna report on the progress that our students are making. And so at some times it can feel that one mark limits our ability to highlight the strengths of our students. We want the best for, and we wanna show the best of our students. So as we consider this shift to one mark throughout our session this evening, keep this in mind. We're gonna address some of the great questions that were sent in in advance, and we will take a look at this idea in action with those case studies. So speaking of questions, this is a question that came in uh, in our first webinar and came back, back around many times this time. So we thought we would take another look. And the question really is, in, it's framed in regards to that change to that one mark. Is it expected that each strand is weighted equally when calculating one mark? So as we consider weighing the four strands to determine one report card mark, we need to remember to consider the instructional context. And this slide illustrates two possible contexts through pie charts showing different proportions of the strands. In the first chart, you're gonna notice that strand B is weighted more heavily than the other strands. So what might be the instructional context that has led to this weighing? This might be a primary classroom with significant word level and uh, reading and spelling needs. And perhaps the teacher is purposely giving a big push to teaching grapheme phoneme correspondences and word level reading and spelling, knowing that this initial investment of instructional time is necessary to support strong comprehension and writing for strands C and D. Maybe again, the same, the same weighting could be a junior or intermediate classroom where students have limited awareness of morphology and syntax. So the teacher is strategically focused on building this knowledge of language foundations and conventions in light of the shift in the curriculum. In the second pie chart, you'll notice that strands C and D are weighted more heavily. Perhaps this is something we would see in a junior or intermediate classroom with accurate fluent readers who have strong knowledge of language foundations and conventions. We might see that the majority of the instruction here is focused on the research-based practice of linking reading and writing. Students write about what they read and they read about what they write. So really there's no formula as to how these strands should be weighed in determining a grade for a report card. And this is a place where your professional judgment's gonna help to guide you. So consider that instructional context, consider what you've taught and consider your students. The case studies a little bit later are gonna help us to see this in action and help with that maybe some of that understanding of the thinking that the teachers had as they determined that mark. And remember that you have professional judgment. So I said it before, I'll say it again, use the assessment data that you've gathered, the observations that you've made, the conversations that you've had and the, what your students have produced. Use the achievement chart, use the curriculum expectations and remember the instructional context. Growing success states that your professional judgment is informed by professional knowledge of curriculum expectations, context, evidence of learning, methods of instruction and assessment, and the criteria and standards that indicate success in student learning. The teacher is to use their professional judgment in communicating achievement with parents and students. So in professional practice, judgment involves purposeful and systematic thinking, processes that evolve in terms of accuracy and insight with ongoing reflection and self-correction. And on that, we're gonna to come to another question that we received a few times, what should be included in a comment to reflect student learning and align with one single grade? Our comments become increasingly important as we make this shift to one mark. As always, we should focus on what students have learned. We should describe their significant strengths and identify next steps for improvement. We should continue to strive to use language that parents will understand and provide them with personalized, clear, precise, and meaningful feedback. Communication about student achievement should be designed to provide detailed information that will encourage students to set goals for learning, help teachers to establish plans for teaching, and assist parents in supporting learning at home. 
Our comments should describe key learning with qualifiers and descriptions, focusing on what students have learned. We can use the information that we've gathered from our observations, from our conversations, from our products to share specific examples of what students have done to demonstrate their strengths. We can then communicate next steps, sharing what the student still needs to accomplish, connected to their learning and be meaningful, clear and attainable. Our comments reflect personalized, clear, precise and meaningful feedback. So although there are formal reporting periods, communication with parents and students about student achievement should be continuous throughout the year by a variety of means. That could be interviews, phone calls, checklists, informal reports. But the comments provide us with a way to communicate what we might have once captured in marks. And they're particularly important as we transition to some of the, the what and how we teach literacy. In a few slides from now, we're gonna walk through some sample student profiles and highlight a few things that we might want to mention when we uh, communicate with par uh, parents and families. So we're going to take a step away from evaluation for just a second in reporting to chat about the collection of data and the information that's going to help us as we work to determine that report card mark. So the difference between assessment and evaluation Assessment and evaluation are different. Assessment is the process of gathering information that accurately reflects how well a student is achieving the curriculum expectations in a subject or course. Our educators are gonna gather information about students before, during, and at, or near the end of a period of instruction using a variety of assessment strategies and tools. And the primary purpose of assessment is to improve student learning. Assessment enables teachers and students to know what understandings, knowledge, and skills are to be learned to help students develop capacity to be independent, autonomous learners, to determine where students are in their learning and to guide next steps towards achieving learning goals. So our assessment should be planned concurrently with instruction. It should be integrated seamlessly into the learning cycle, illuminate what students know and can do, thereby guiding next steps in instruction as the teacher determines how to address strengths and learning opportunities. And it should help both teachers and students monitor progress towards achieving goals. Evaluation is the process of judging the quality of a student's learning of the achievement of the overall expectations. Teachers use their professional judgment to determine which specific expectations to teach in order to evaluate achievement of the overall expectations. Evaluation accurately summarizes and communicates to parents and others and students themselves what students know and can do with respect to the overall curriculum expectations. Evaluation is based on assessment of learning that provides evidence of student achievement at strategic times throughout the course and often at the end of a period of learning. The primary purpose of assessment is to improve student learning. So consider what you use to assess your students. How are you gathering that information to determine what evidence-based instruction you will provide to align with the needs of your students? And this leads nicely into a, another question that was sent in in advance of tonight's session. How do I determine a reading mark without using a level-based assessment? So this is a really important question and a really common question that we are hearing a lot this year. And I think it stems from the point that many boards are shifting away from using DRA, uh, Fontes and Penal, GB+, Alpha Gen, due to many concerns about how poorly researched these tools are. The Ontario Human Rights Commission summarizes this issue really nicely highlighting that these tools are not well-researched and we cannot trust the data that they provide. The idea of reading levels is really unreliable and not instructionally useful, and these tools don't tell us about the important skills that we as educators need to know to effectively teach children to read. There's a really great handout on Onlet called Reconsidering Reading Levels that walks through some of these points. So take a look, onlet.org, if you are interested. Um, there's another issue at play here. And that's that even ignoring these points, should we ever have been using these for evaluations in the first place? Even if these were high quality tools, which they're not, the, it, it, is that a meaningful source of insight that allows us to triangulate data points from conversations, observations, and products to generate a mark for reading? The authors and publishers of these measures emphasize that these levels are to be a tool for educators to help inform instruction, and are not to be used for evaluation and reporting to parents. Our new language curriculum is skill focused. It's grounded in the foundational language and literacy skills that we know from research are necessary for all children to be skilled, proficient readers to be able to access all of the benefits literacy affords. Our evaluation and reporting is also skills focused. 
On this slide, we've included a very, very simplified table highlighting some of the skills in the B2 language foundations continuum. Remember that there's a parallel continuum, the B3 language conventions continuum that should also be used to understand student achievement and ex expectations. Understanding students' accuracy and automaticity with these language foundations, that B2 continuum, and language conventions, the B3 continuum, in combination with the B1 overall expectations of oral and nonverbal communication can be triangulated for a mark for strand B. A leveled-based assessment is not needed and it is not appropriate. And we do have that link to the reconsidering reading levels in the chat if you do want to take a look at that. While boards are shifting away from those tools, the FNP, the DRA, the PM, the GB+, many are exploring early reading screeners, and this is fantastic. It's an evidence-based practice. Another of the key recommendations of the Ontario Human Rights Commission is to use those evidence-based screening tools. This is a reminder, though, that these tools, these screeners, should not be used for evaluation. The ministry explicitly states that screening data from those tools like Acadians, Dibbles, EDCBM, and AIMSWeb should not be used for the evaluation of curriculum expectations. Again, check out that link to reconsidering reading levels. It's going to give you a really clear breakdown of those differences between screening, diagnostic assessment, progress monitoring, and evaluation. A note about screening measures, they are brief one-minute indicators of a specific skill. They are not measures designed to evaluate student achievement of overall expectations in the curriculum. It is tempting to use that at, above, below, and well below benchmark label from those screeners to directly inform your report card marks. This practice is not supported by either the Ministry of Education or by the screening researchers. The benchmarks are not correlated with grades and are intended as assessment for learning to drive teacher instruction and as learning to show progression along the trajectory. While not used for evaluative purposes, screening data can be used to find students who need instructional support in order to plan instruction that will target any skill deficits. They can be used to group students for instruction. So teachers can first conduct screening assessments and then sometimes diagnostic assessments, analyze that data to form small groups based on similar instructional needs, plan evidence-based instruction focused on identified student needs, teach or remediate and administer progress monitoring assessments over time. And that is all outlined in that great book that we have for one lucky winner tonight, Next Steps in Literacy Instruction. Screening also provides system-wide feedback. So by using that screening data to reflect the health of the instructional system, administrators can move their schools beyond a student-by-student -student intervention approach to a systems-level approach that will potentially improve reading outcomes for a larger number of students. In addition, it can inform decisions about which skills should be the focus of reading interventions. Screening measures growth over time, and it ensures that the instructional system is supporting students in achieving their reading goals. Early reading screening is, for all students is crucial. When screening happens, schools can identify struggling and at-risk readers to provide early and targeted intervention. Objective assessment of foundational reading skills is essential for all students, but particularly for groups that have historically faced systematic barriers. Assessment that is rooted in culturally responsive and relevant pedagogy, as well as understanding how teacher bias could impact assessment can support the best outcomes for all students. You can look through all these points on this slide and you can find this in Growing Success, but some of the highlights include asking ourselves if the tasks are accessible to and inclusive of all learners and connect to their prior learning, do tasks reflect students' identities and lived experiences? Do all students have equitable access to the tools they need? And very relevant to our session tonight, how can information be conveyed to students and families in an ongoing and meaningful way? What is the purpose of assigning and grading a specific task or activity? So as we come to the end of this first part of our webinar and move into our case studies, we wanna bring back this graphic that we talked about the first time as a way of representing how conversations, observations, and products across the strands can converge into one mark. And it's important to notice that this determination of one mark is done in the context of instruction and your professional judgment. This helps to clarify, for example, if strands should be weighted differently. We've shown how marks then narrow to one single mark, and then those comments allow educators to extend and enhance elaborating on student strengths, growth, and next step to give additional detail to that one mark. Another important note is the positioning of strand A with a focus on transferable skills, digital media literacy, and cross-curricular integrated learning. 
The skills and processes of the overall expectations in strand A are used in the teaching and learning of strands B, C, and D and should be assessed and evaluated within those contexts. So now that we've laid the groundwork, we're going to dig into some case studies. And these are updates from our wonderful case studies. So if you were here the first time around, you're going to get to hear how our students have progressed to the end of the year. And we're going to start by taking a look at uh, an intermediate student, followed by a junior student, and then wrap it up with our primary student and some time for questions. Note that these students are either students with details changed or they are hypothetical students generated from common patterns. So I'm going to pass you over now to Melissa, and she's going to talk to us about a student, an intermediate student. Hello, good evening. So we're going to be talking about a grade seven student. Um, if you were with us in January, you'll remember that when the teacher did a whole class assessment, there was a definite need to focus on uh, strand B. There was a long, a, a large lacking in their morphological knowledge as well as their syntax and vocabulary. So the teacher spent a lot of time um, in that strand. So even though the student was still having an um, issue in January, developing and organizing their ideas, it wasn't the focus of the class. Cut to term two, we now have a shift away from that language foundation and the teacher is spending more time in strand C and D. Just like at the beginning, um, the first session, this student continues to be a very fluent and accurate reader. Um, universal screeners are showing that they are exactly where they need to be. And the student has shown their ability to read and respond to reading in a variety of authentic settings. They continue to engage regularly um, in whole group, as well as individual conversations related to all sorts of types of texts, everything part of through Strand A, the student is able to engage in conversations of. Even though the teacher is doing a whole class um, instructional focus on composition, the student continues to require extensive support from the teacher. While they continue to show effective, effectiveness in other areas of the language curriculum, that D1.1, the developing ideas and organizing content, as well as D1.2, the creating of content, continues to show areas of need. So thinking about the achievement chart here, we are, of course, moving towards thinking about the achievement chart as a whole. But of course, as we are learning through these strands, we are. it is possible to see that a student can show their knowledge across one strand differently than um, in another strand. So when the teacher is looking at this student across the achievement chart, they notice that the student's areas of needs are closely tied to their ability to communicate through writing and to de demonstrate proficiency in composition. When this, the teacher is looking at it through the lens of oral communication, the student has a lot, um, has, is able to show a higher degree of effectiveness. The other issue that the, the teacher is noticing is that the student is having difficulty applying their knowledge in new contexts. So while they might be able to learn, for instance, about morphology and syntax, when they go to apply that in a new situation, a new context, the student is having um, difficulty with that, despite still having high level of effectiveness in their oral um, capabilities. So when we're, what we're looking at here is that um, the first part at the top there is page five of growing success. So this is encouraging teachers again, like Jordan has said, to use the professional judgment, but also to interpret the evidence um, looking at the, con the most consistent level of achievement as well as special consideration to the most recent. So what we might have seen in February, you can sort of see here that in February and March, the student was struggling quite a lot and uh, to show their abilities in composition. As we progressed through the term, we were seeing a little bit more consistency come out through the, the, um, the work and that while our inclination might be to average across these grades, uh, growing success does give us the ability to use our professional judgment as well as to think of this, the, the more recent um, evidence. You can see below too that when we're thinking about the time spent on each strand, in term one, that um, strand B took up a lot more time, whereas here it was a little bit more equally weighted between strands D and C. Looking at, um, so th thinking about the student 
and how they've shown con uh, considerable effectiveness across strands A, B, and C, they're still limited in their ability to demonstrate proficiency in strand D. So as much as the whole, um, because the whole class instruction was focused on those strands C and D, the teacher has determined that the final grade here that cap best captures the, the achievement of this student at this time would be a 72, which would be a B minus, but it's intermediate, so they use that percentage. All right, thank you, Melissa, for uh, walking us through that uh, case study there. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Siobhan Doyle. And if you were with us last uh, last webinar, we walked through a junior case study working with a student in grade five. So thinking back to slides here. There we go. So looking back to where the student was um, earlier in the year, to recap, back in January, she was a strong, accurate, and fluent reader with proficient spelling and morphological knowledge. She demonstrated strong comprehension and oral language skills, but struggled at times with compound and complex sentences, specifically when writing. We often saw either sentence fragments in her writing or run-on sentences, and she would frequently omit proper punctuation and capitalization. So because there showed to be a class-wide need in this area, significant instructional time was spent earlier in the year in strand B, but specifically this B3 continuum, uh, targeting syntax and sentence structure. And you know, with the introduction of the new curriculum, there was a lot of new learning for students, uh, as well as teachers, myself included. So looking ahead now to, to where we are now in May, if we take a look at the same student now at this point in the year, we can, or we remark here that she continues to be, uh, to demonstrate rather strong decoding skills, reading with fluency and accuracy still. And that's been monitored throughout the year with the help of things like oral reading fluency measures to, to monitor her progress. Her spelling continues to develop as well as her morphological knowledge. Um, keeping in mind that explicit instruction in morphology has continued throughout the year as well and become increasingly more, more complex as the year has gone on. And the student has now demonstrated growth in the area of language conventions. She is now applying many of these conventions in her writing, uh, improving her composition. So here we have our um, achievement chart. And if you look in the, the top corner there, you can see how our pie chart is, is broken down. And you'll notice that uh, a lot of the weight in this term was spent in, uh, in strand D. So that's focusing on things like developing, creating, publishing texts. As we mentioned, the student has shown significant growth in applying her knowledge of language conventions from strand B in her creation of texts now. So specifically, once again, that B3 continuum of learning which included specific conventions that were the focus of instruction. So these may have been things like independent and dependent clauses, uh, sentence fragments, uh, positives, as well as building towards complex and compound sentences. Um, we saw before that our student often was limited to simple sentences. So her use of capitalization and punctuation has improved, though she still requires occasional support and prompting to apply them when writing her own independent texts. And these might be uh, in contexts such as like proper nouns, adjectives, uh, commas after transition words, things like that. So while she demonstrates considerable success with the development and creation of text in this strand D, teacher support is still needed and required to initiate this editing process, uh, and things like critically analyzing her own work, which, which we know are components then of the strand D requirements or um, objectives where that's where a lot of our instructional focus was spent this uh, this term. So I know we mentioned a couple of times already by both Melissa and Jordan, but evidence of student achievement, once again, is collected through observations, conversations, products, as well as teachers' professional judgment informing. And we want to remember to acknowledge that some of this evidence might carry more weight and is reflective of their most consistent level of achievement. So looking at our hypothetical grade five student here, um, in this case, keeping in mind the instructional context, what was taught in the students themselves, an overall grade of B would, uh, would be given in this case here. We'll move on now to have a look at Laura Bross and her student in primary. Okay, 
If you joined us for part one, you'll remember this is a grade two student. He has DLD, Developmental Language Disorder, and no IEP. He does not receive any resource support. To help us work toward building a report card for this child, report card mark for this child, I'll walk you through some progress the student has made this year and what strengths and needs I'm currently observing. In September, the student did not read. He did not initiate reading. Phonemically, he had significant difficulties identifying sounds and distinguishing between similar sounds. In writing, significant difficulties were observed as well. The student did not initiate writing, and when he did, it was illegible and made of scribbles. We'll show you a writing sample on a later slide. Based on the report from Speech Language, it wasn't unexpected that the child had significant difficulty with language. He struggled to use appropriate syntax, tense, and vocabulary when speaking. Generally, he was reserved and didn't say much in the classroom setting, but he was very chatty and communicative with his peers. Now, in May, we see continued growth for this student. In reading, he can now read single syllable words fluently. He blends continuously when sounding out words instead of slowly segmenting each sound. He is reading more high frequency words automatically. He is accurate when reading multisyllable words that contain short vowel sounds, known words, or beginning inflectional morphemes. With the skills he is automatic with, he can sometimes he can read sentences fluently, but still needs more instruction with vowel teams, morphology, and multisyllable words to increase his reading accuracy and rate. He will now choose to read decodable and authentic books for practice and for pleasure. In spelling, he can segment and spell most phoneme graphing correspondences in isolated spelling tasks. He will use the sound wall to help find the correct spelling. He still has some difficulty with L and R in blends due to articulation challenges. In sentence writing, he will accurately spell CVC, CVCE, and some high frequency words, but will have some errors, errors due to the additional cognitive load of writing in sentences. In phonemic awareness, he can segment and blend much more fluently. He can still have difficulties isolating L and R and R control vowels due to articulation difficulties, but can identify the sound with a prompt to segment again. He can hear known morphemes in words such as ing, is, and un. In composition, he can write legibly with small letter formation. When writing longer sentences, his letter formation will be less accurate, but still legible. He will now write simple sentences conf confidently and independently. He can write some high frequency words automatically, such as and, will, and the, and will segment and spell each sound in other words. He will start writing on his own without needing prompts or a sentence starter from the teacher. He now chooses to write during free choice activities. In comprehension, he is engaged during read alouds and will make relevant comments and predictions on the text. He will write in a response to a read aloud, which I'll show in an example later on. With decodables that he can read fluently, he can summarize and retell the important details. He needs further instruction on syntax when reading complex sentences to ensure his reading comprehension growth. In oral language, he continues to share his thinking and use newly taught vocabulary in conversation. He notices taught vocabulary words during read alouds and conversations. When he heard the word occasional on the announcements, he announced to the class that it means that we can only do that now and then, not very often. He loves hearing our new vocabulary words in authentic conversation. While it isn't to be used for evaluation, here are data from this child's universal screening. This slide shows nonsense word fluency, which is a measure of students' ability to read non-words. It generates two scores the number of correct letter sounds, and the number of whole words read. In September, this child was well below benchmark in both scores. His word level reading was really, really weak. Across the year, with explicit and systematic instruction in phonics, decoding, and spelling, these skills have strengthened, and we see really significant growth in these skills, with them meeting benchmark in March. I have now stopped progress monitoring this skill since he has met the target. I am also monitoring this child's progress with reading connected text. While there is growth across the year, it's slower than the growth we see in NWF. This isn't surprising since an oral reading fluency measure taps a really large outcome skill, 
the ability to read connected text accurately at a good rate. It is an indicator of overall reading proficiency. So it makes sense that this is moving more slowly than word reading level, than word level reading in NWF. I continue to use ORF since it marks our goal. We want to see this child reading accurately at a good rate. This spring, I also started using the progress monitoring passages from UFLY. This gives me an additional source of information and helps to highlight how he's doing with the code he has been taught. Now let's look at some writing samples. First, we have his September spelling diagnostic. He has some consistent co consonant letter sound knowledge. From my observation notes, he really struggled with letter formation during this task. And as the list progressed, he was exhausted by it. Word 12, I had to help him get through it as he was getting overwhelmed by the workload. Next, we see this diagnostic, which was completed again in January. This was completely unassisted and done in a whole group setting. He happily completed it. Letter formation has improved greatly and his pencil grip no longer exhausts his hands. He is accurate with consonant sounds and blends, short vowels, and some digraphs. I had not yet explicitly taught long vowel teams in our sequence, so it's expected that he did not include that pattern. Finally, we see the diagnostic completed again last week. Again, he completed this unassisted in a whole group setting. He happily spelled the words, giving me little grins when he knew he had it right. His letter formation continues to improve. We can see his accuracy with CVC, most blends, and CVCE. He is accurate with the suffix ing. He still requires more instruction and practice opportunities on vowel teams and affixes, but all the words are phonemically accurate. He was so proud when I laid these three samples out for him to see the visible evidence of his growth this year. Sorry. Now let's look at some authentic writing. <laughs> I honestly do not have a September sample. The student could not write on his own. It would, have, it would be scribbles or lines. It was through our explicit spelling routines that he began to start writing. In January, he completed this writing task. In January, he completed this writing task in our science unit on structures. To lead up to this, students worked in groups to reread a text about a famous structure, and then using a template inspired by the writing rev revolution, they crafted four well-written sentences. I was then able to meet with this student and rewrite his four sentences on his page so he had a neat model to use. He then took these sentences and combined them into a, this paragraph about the Eiffel Tower. He was so proud of this work and proudly displayed it on our hallway bulletin board. In the January example, he needed lots of support to get these complex sentences onto the page. Now I have an example from just last week of his writing that was completely unassisted. During our class read aloud, we were finishing the third book from the Wild Robot series. For this read aloud, I gave each student a notebook and each day they wrote a quick summary of what we read that day. The students were so engaged with this story and were so eager to update their own wild robots each wild robot books each day. He wrote this sentence without any assistance. It was a perfect summary of what had happened in the read aloud that day. It is legible, mostly accurate, and was done completely independently without any assistance. Such growth from his anxious scribbles in September. Instructional routines are an essential part of our day. These routines are non-negotiables in our classroom. We always complete these, even on special days, we find a way to ensure they are complete. Our daily pen review is a routine inspired from the OG classroom educator training by Teachers for Reading Canada. We use pens for this because I do not want students to spend their precious time erasing. If we make an error, we strike it out and carry on. This normalizes error cor correction as part of our learning. In this six minute routine, we review previously taught content. First for 30 seconds, we practice letter formation. I circulate and give immediate feedback to all students, but intentionally target the few students left who are still working on accuracy in this skill. After this, I reset our timer for five minutes. Using the UFLY manual as a reference, I dictate sounds, words, and a sentence. 
One helpful dictation method I learned from the OG classroom educator training was to dictate sounds with multiple spellings with the following prompt. Spell the two ways to spell ow. This simple statement makes it explicit to students that there are more than one way to spell the same sound. As a class, we corally repeat back the sounds, words, and sentences to ensure accurate pronunciation as we spell them. I'm also modeling the written work on the screen as an additional scaffold for the students. I select the content based on the needs of my students, so this review is intentional and purposeful every day. Next, we complete a three minute grid routine. The programming team in my school board, Avon Maitland District School Board, created these and are available on the Onlet resource library. I double side the weekly grid, one with single syllable words and the other with multi-syllable words. Students select which side they want to practice with. Again, I choose this content based on the skills that the students need additional practice with. During this time, I have also started running a quick small group where four students are working on sentence reading fluency. Um, they join me and we read sentence pyramid cards. I wanted to do something additional with this group and this was the best time I could fit it in. Up next, we complete a seven minute repeated reading routine. I printed off numerous one page decodable passages. These range from UFLY, West Virginia Phonics, The Reading Universe, and sets I purchased from the literacy nest Emily Gibbons. I numbered, laminated, and color coded them by our scope and sequence following the UFLY scope and sequence. There is also a box from ReadWorks for my few students who are advanced readers that are about topics from our content subjects. We did a lot of behavior practice to start this routine and, it, and made it very clear what was expected and what our group plan was. Once we were successful with the routine, I now use this seven minutes to work one-on-one -on -one with a pre-verbal student with exceptional needs who was working on identifying and generating letter sounds and doing letter formation. The whole group is working on reading fluency while he gets instruction on his modified goals. Our class knows that they need to work effectively during this time so their friend can get the instruction he needs with me. After the routine, we celebrate someone for following the group plan or for their reading skills. I would like to add that we do not have 100% engagement rate during this routine. These are kids. They have off days or forget what's expected. And I am focused on my exceptional student at that time. But since we do this every day, always reviewing our purpose and expectations, they are engaged in the practice most of the time. After these review routines, we start our routines for learning new content. At the end of this 15, 20, 15 to 20 minutes, we do something called rotations. Students sign up for either reading, writing, partner, or technology. Students work independently while I do small group instruction. During this small group instruction, I give targeted students an additional dose of instruction on the specific skills they need. These students require the smaller group and greater intensity to ensure their success. Recently, with my grade two student, we have been reviewing vowel teams and a set of mnemonic cards, with a set of mnemonic cards, reading words and sentences from pyramid cards, the same set from the sentence fluency group mentioned earlier previously, and then reading decodable text. A few months ago, I used the clapping game I learned from Sherry Rain during an IDA Ontario Live event to teach continuous blending. This accelerated his blending and word reading skills immediately and made a huge impact on his word level reading. One final thing I would like to add is that these routines change slightly based on the skills and needs of the students. My class last year was much calmer. I could be more flexible in our routines and in the language I use. This year, my class is full of energy and they test my classroom management and instructional skills every day. They require clear and consistent routines and expectations. My instructional block seen on the Onlet library had to be changed this year to limit the number of transitions to ensure all students could be successful. Instructional routines are crucial to our success. And as a teacher, I have had to make adjustments to ensure our time was used most effectively. Our routines also change as the year progresses, spend, moving from spending more instructional time on word level reading to now more on morphology and sentence and text level reading. 
These routines are my attempts at putting research into practice with a real group of students. This grade two student has started to make the shift between the acquisition stage of his learning towards fluency and generalization of these skills. The instructional context of the student is in, this, in this school year has been an emphasis on strand B. He requires a lot of explicit instruction and practice opportunities to ensure his success with foundational skills. He is fluent within isolated tasks, focused on the foundation skill itself, but still building his fluency to apply these skills in more difficult contexts at the sentence and text level. In strand C, he is able to show understanding and comprehension with texts that he can fluently decode and during oral language tasks. He still needs more instruction on syntax, word order, and cohesive ties, as he can still have comprehension difficulties with complex sentences during read-alouds. In strand B, he requires more, much more instruction in composition and writing. He is now able to write a sentence independently to respond to a text or a prompt. However, he still needs intense instruction to support and support to write longer texts that require planning and processing skills. After this analysis, I have decided to give the student a C- on his term two report card. His instru instructional context was focused on developing his foundational reading and writing skills, as seen in the previous examples. He has shown tremendous growth. However, he is still he is still needs he still needs intense instruction to improve his reading fluency, understanding complex sentences, and applying these skills into extended writing pieces. On page 18 of Growing Success, this is how the achievement of a level two is defined. This student is not yet at provincial standard, but he is approaching it. He has demonstrated some skills, but still needs instruction on the things identified previously to ensure his success. A C minus, C minus on his report card acknowledges the tremendous growth and progress of the student, but still shows the intense instructional need for future growth. After completing the spelling inventory last week, I shared this visible evidence of his learning with his parents. This was mom's response. Her response is a valuable reminder for me on the importance of our instruction. As Anita Archer says, success breeds motivation. Evidence-informed instruction is an essential protective factor that we can provide to all of our students. There are so many things we can't change, but we can change instruction and instruction can have an incredibly powerful impact. Evidence-informed instruction supports our students' mental health and well-being, their achievement in school, and it ensures all students have equitable access to opportunities that they need to meet their potential. And now we're back to Jordan. Thank you to Laura, to Siobhan, and to Melissa for sharing these wonderful updates. We got lots of great feedback, Laura, in the chat. I'll give you a moment to take a look at that. Before we get into some of the questions that we received this evening, I want to highlight a few of the key takeaways from our time together. First, a reminder to consider the instructional context in the evaluation of student achievement and the determination of a single mark. Second, with the shift to the single mark, comments give us the opportunity to connect growth and key learning and to build partnership with families. And finally, a reminder to give yourself grace. We're all in this together. You are a skilled professional and have the judgment and the insight to do this. So I'm going to pass it over to Alicia now because I think we have a few questions that have come in over the course of this evening. Thank you all for that. That was amazing. And so many wonderful comments popping in, Laura. It was so nice to see the continuation of that because we got the first half of, of that student in January. We had so many questions and I'm so glad that you shared Additionally, some of the things that you're doing in your classroom. So looking at the questions. Um, so there was a question in here about, you know, communicating with parents, right? So someone asked about the universal screeners and how you mentioned that they shouldn't be used for um, grading or evaluation. But of course, there is that new box on the report card. So do you have any tips for how you might communicate this with parents so that it's not confusing? Yeah, so I think I can start and then Laura and Melissa and Siobhan, you can jump in anytime. I mean, with parents, really, it's that ongoing communication all year long, right? We did talk about that. And Laura talked a lot about that when she was talking about her kiddo there. Um, 
taking that time to clarify those terms and that jargon. This new curriculum has a lot of terms that might be new, that might be challenging. Um, we do have a parent glossary with Onlet that I'm wondering if we can put in the chat or if you can look through onlet.org to find that. There's also a, a ministry page for parents, and there is some stuff in there that, that could be shared around that screener. And I know a lot of schools are putting together parent literacy nights. Um, I think we've got some stuff on Onlet there that can provide some support as well. Does anyone else want to hop in on that one? Sure, I can sort of say I, I was um, in kindergarten this year. And um, again, it's it's all obviously it's all new and it's all new to a lot of the parents, especially the parents who um, might have their firstborn children that haven't gone through a system already. And it was just something that I sort of shared as extra evidence, right? It wasn't the only evidence that I was using, but it was part of the conversation. I found for kindergarten parents, they were actually quite happy to see this because um, of sort of a, a lack of maybe checklisty type things of, of being able to have something tangible to look at to see where their student is on a, on a continuum. And they were really appreciative. I, of course, used that parent and uh, caregiver glossary to, we gave that out at um, I, I believe it was the meet the teacher or some, on one of our literacy nights, we gave it up pretty early in the year so that they could have the vocabulary and the knowledge. And we just spoke to it as being part of what we use, not the thing that we use. And I think for parents who were used to level books, that was one of the first questions I got. When am I getting a level books? What level is my kid at? It gave us a different um, set of vocabulary to discuss student progress. Did anybody else want to jump in on that? No? Okay, great. Um, so another question here is, how much does uh, decoding or reading a grade level text weigh on the overall mark? And there's an example of a student that has great ideas in writing with some spelling errors um, and can make incredible connections with books that are read, uh, but is reading below grade level, um, sorry, with books that are read that are below grade level or that are read to him by the teacher, but the student cannot decode at grade level. So one mark seems like it's masking the fact that he cannot read at grade level or is a lower mark masking the fact that he is, that it's just the decoding that hold, is holding him back. So really, how do you weight that? I can start us off with that one maybe. I would say that, um, that's really when the comments come into play. Um, and comments then can give nuance to, you know, how the student is um, is performing. So whether, you know, you have your one mark, but then your comments can add things, add those strengths or weaknesses um, for, you know, in parent-friendly language as well. So they can better understand, okay, they get a better full picture of where their where their child is at. Um, that's one thing I would, I would highly suggest. Did anybody else want to jump in on that? Yeah, I would think I would just add, and I know Laura talked about this in hers, is that none of it should be a surprise, yeah. right? Like mm -hmm. that the report card mark should not be a surprise, that even the comment shouldn't be a surprise, that if you've got that communication happening the entire time, then the parent knows, okay, they're getting this mark and, and here are all the pieces that are coming together. Yeah, and one thing I would add, I think is crucial is when you're you're sharing this evidence or examples that you have a plan. And I find once teachers, once I share like this is what I'm going to do to help them move forward, then they're 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 on board. <laughs> so when they have that, like we have a goal, we have a plan set in place, then um, everybody has something to look forward to and and jump on. Great. Uh, so we have another question here that I think is directed at you, Laura, and it's, can we get a copy of your daily pen review template? <laughs> I just posted it in the chat. That's why I missed the last couple questions. I was oh, looking wonderful. For I didn't see that. That's great. Okay. Caring um, is caring. Enjoy. <laughs> yeah, we had another question, and I think I think you could answer this, Laura, but I think the others would have something to add here, too. Um, other than you fly, where else are you getting decodable text passages from for your repeated reading routines? Um, so I have UFLY and if you go to the Reading Universe website, they have a set on there that's free to download that I, I really like them for small groups as well. They have um, warm up words and like a little teacher section right built into it. So it, it's kind of all set up for you. Um, and I like using one pagers too for my small groups because then kids aren't 
you're not trying to get all the kids on the same page. They're just on one page. It's a little easier for management. Um, and uh, the West Virginia phonics ones, I think, are still freely available floating around. So those are kind of the three main ones I use. And then I have purchased an OG set um, from Emily Gibbons. She's an OG educator that you can find online, the Literacy Nest. But those ones I've purchased, they weren't a huge cost, but the first three examples are freely available. Excellent. Anybody else want to give their favorite sources? Uh, phonicsandstuff.com um, is a great one because you can actually plug in the concepts that you have taught them already and it will generate some for you. Um, and this is a shameless plug for the IDA, but the, the uh, basics of phonics and spell, decoding and spelling uh, instructional course that actually shows you how easy it is to really make your own. And Laura, I think, in, and Siobhan's older, but like in grade two, you really only need a sentence or two to get some of those fluency going. You don't need lots and lots. So the sentence can be a, a you know a good way to practice too. Uh, but yeah, that, that course will show you how to do it. But phonicsandstuff.com uh, will make a whole list for you depending on what each student knows, which makes it nice to differentiate in your, your groups too. If you know that uh, you have a core group that maybe don't have as many concepts on the of the 44 phonemes as another group, you can sort of tailor it to them. Great. Uh, we had another question. So we had um, at the beginning when Jordan was talking about screening and, and how screening data shouldn't be on the report card, there was a bit of a chat going on about um, screeners versus diagnostic assessment. And someone asked, is it acceptable to use diagnostics like the core phonics survey or the quick phonics screener data collected over time to inform the report card mark and comment? You want to take that, Jordan? I actually going to throw that back because I think Melissa answered it really well in the chat. So I'm going to let her re just reply what she did when she answered in there. Great. I think what's so exciting about the new curriculum is that we have that continuum of the skills from that K-1 all the way up to grade four to really see the progression. And what is already laid out for you are the how the government wants us to be teaching those phonemes in what order and uh, which ones are great appropriate. So using something like core phonics um, or scholastic red or any of those QPSs, if you check that back against that continuum um, and sort of just highlight as you go, you'll get a really strong indicator, just a visual one. You'll be able to see most of this student's skills are in the SK1 profile or most of them are lying in the grade one or grade two. And you can actually just cross reference it to see if they are decoding at grade level. That's something we've never had before. So it's it's a powerful tool for sure. Excellent. There's a question in the Q&A that I think was really similar to that where someone was asking, you know, if there is an organizational document somewhere that has all of those, but it's really, it is the continuum really. I mean, a simplified version of the continuum I think might be uh, helpful. Do, does anybody have, do we have one of those? Is there one of those available at this point? that you can use for checking off those skills? Is that something we should be making at Onlet? Just a simplified version that we can put up there that you can highlight? <laughs> we'll add that to the production list. Um, also on there, I saw a lot of questions about the, the mnemonic cards that you had, Laura. Um, you can certainly share where you got yours and uh, I will let everyone know that Onlet is in the process of creating one. We've hired some lovely, like a lovely artist to, to draw the pictures and things. Uh, and the one that you had, Laura, was from where? It's very cute. No, oh, I not I I honestly I don't like saying TPT, but that one was off TPT. <laughs> I was just very critical of the one I picked. Um, but I would recommend that the ones that Onlet are going to release at some point are probably going to be pretty nice. So I would wait, maybe pick those up. But and um, free and I use I had I use the Spellphabet ones mostly, but I needed some more vowel teams recently, so that's why I picked those ones up recently. But. Excellent. Yes, the onlet one will be available soon, hopefully. Uh, we're very excited about that. Um, okay, if anybody has any last questions, feel free to, to put them in the chat. Otherwise, we will move on to the prizes. Does anybody have any last chat questions for these lovely ladies? I see lots of really positive comments, lots mm -hmm. of, you're so amazing. This has been great. Well, thank you everyone. Okay, so just don't leave yet because we still have to do prizes. So let me just share my screen back. 
And oh yes, if you uh, would like to have, if you have any further questions about the content for tonight's webinar or really anything else, you can always reach out to our team at, um, at Onlet. So you just email info at onlet.org and these lovely ladies and the rest of our team are always on hand to answer your questions. We also have coming up this week, um, our very first cat chat. This is a drop-in session. So it's just a Zoom meeting session where you can come and actually talk live to our team members. So we'll put them in different breakout rooms um, where you can go and speak with different individuals from our team. So you can bring any of your additional questions there. And that information again is on onlet.org. You can sign up for it and it's just drop in. And we'll be doing those, uh, three of those and to get us to the end of the school year. And then we're planning on doing those regularly next year as well. So we hope to see you there. Thank you to our lovely Onlet team and thank you, MJ. And thank you all for joining us and we hope we will see you on Wednesday and at future webinars. <laughs>